Hey everybody, this is Chuck here for DeucesCrack.com, coming at you with another episode of Beginning Omaha 8. Um, in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about blind defense, uh, what kind of hands should we be defending, why we're defending those hands. Then uh, move on to when and why to be 3-betting preflop, uh, specific to Omaha 8 or better. And again, everything we're doing here in these preflop episodes is tying into our post-flop game plan. So uh, it's an important thing to keep in mind as you play more 08 and as you watch future videos um, that everything we're doing now is to prepare ourselves for decisions that we have to make post-flop. So let's talk a little bit about blind defense. Um, it's pretty unique in Omaha 8 or better versus a lot of games simply because it, it I think 08 and I do fancy myself someone that plays all the games is the one where you're most likely to be taking a limped flop. Uh, players do think it's correct to limp a lot more. It's just a more passive game. So in other words, we're not expecting other players at the table to have those seat to seat preflop raising ranges like we had. So we can't really be planning to defend certain things versus an under the gun open versus certain things versus a middle position open. Now for the first orbit or two, it's pretty easy for us to uh, you know, just go by some defaults here. But in general, uh, we're going to be looking at our defense as a function of how loose the range we think we're facing is. And, you know, obviously, we're going to start with a tight early position raise, but then go over to aggressive buttons and see what type of hands we need to defend versus what type of player. In general, uh, let's talk a little bit about our play from the blinds. Um, in any game, being in the blinds is a significant disadvantage. Right? And maybe not. I'm sure you can create a game, but uh, let's uh, skip the details for once. Um, me, of course. Um, so we need to have a specific strategy. We have to have, keep a lot of things in mind um, and be prepared to be forced to play these hands out of position. Right. Our goal is to lose as little as possible when we're playing in the blinds. And it doesn't mean we're getting a good price. We have to call everything. And uh, really what we're going to end up finding is that people's poor play from the blinds is what makes playing 08 really so profitable. Um, the most important thing that we start with when we play from the blinds is that we have a post-flop game plan. In any situation when you're going to be re-raising a hand from the blinds, which we're not going to be doing very often, uh, but more importantly, if we're going to be calling a hand out of the blinds or defending, you want to have an idea of how you're going to be able to play that hand post-flop. What are you actually going to do? For example, let's say you want to defend a hand like Jack, 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 Jack. I would say, what are you going to do with that? Just try to bluff a straight or call with your naked pair of jacks. Um, try to think of what the best possible flop for your hand is going to look like and if that really is very good for you. All right, some hands, even when you flop the nuts, you're not that excited. Jack 10, 6-6. Six, six. I mean, it's great to have flopped seven, eight, nine, but it's really not that good of a situation for us. If the board pairs, if the low comes in, um, you know, that's an easy mental test you can do. Just what would your post-flop game plan look like with this hand? Now, I'm not saying you have to sit there and mull it over, over and over again, but it's something you can keep in mind. Um, and honestly, if you're in a slow game, it's something to think about while you're waiting for people to limp to you in the big blind. One of the most important things you have to do when out of position is really avoid middling cards. Now, of course, when I'm saying middling cards, I mean naked middling cards. So uh, I'm not saying let's fold ace, two, seven, eight, right? I'm saying hands that are relying on the middling cards as opposed to that's the garbage that's helping us here. But they really don't do much for us out of position. We do not like check raising um, the low end of straights and the low end of those middling boards. Uh, in general, it's just not a play you're going to make all too often in 08. Um, and like I said, we, these are hands that can also flop nuts or, you know, something very strong. And it's really just when you hit the best flop, it's still a check callable flop. And that's what happens with these hands. And the reason why people would want to consider playing them is because they can, again, make a low because it can make a low. A 78 low is technically a low, again, in the same way that Two seven high is technically a high hand um, that can't exist. But uh, in other words, they don't really have much value for us here. And out of position where we're going to be have to be playing a guessing game, it's really important that we have some strength to our hand. Uh, 
a big problem that you're going to run into is that you're going to play against players, and it's not a problem because we make a ton of money off of this, but players that just don't know how to play Omaha 8 or better. Players that make solid, I'll, I'll in four lines of text show you why it is a fundamental error. And when that's the case, we need to have some strength in our checking and calling range when out of position because very often it's going to be correct to call because we're getting a good price. Um, and players play sporadically and bluff in spots that make no sense. All right, even though we can read a board texture and know what's a good card to barrel, doesn't mean our opponents do. So for this reason, I really say avoid those sevens and eights and nines. They're really, really bad cards. And finally, the, the most important part of early adjusting in 08 is going to be from blind defense and noticing your opponent's opening ranges and limping ranges. Um, I talked about it earlier. Again, when you do something with one hand, you can't do it with another. People, um, a big part of that last point I made on people not understanding the game means you can then interpret that information to be, this is how this player thinks you're supposed to play. They think that, for example, um, I was playing the other day and I opened under the gun in a five-handed game and the small blind three bet me with Jack, Jack, seven, five rainbow which is a very, very bad hand. Um, and it's a really bad hand to be three betting out of position, even worse from my under the gun open. And that was a moment where, you know, who, I don't even know if I won the hand. All I remember is thinking this is a great situation for me because now I know this player thinks that these pocket pairs and any two low qualifying cards qualifies for a, a three bet out of position. This range is going to be so wide. I can now adjust my play accordingly. And you better believe that I'm going to adjust any blind defense I have against this player because their ranges are going to be incredibly wide. And that's what I mean by be ready to adjust. Like the real way to make profit in this game is to find the mistakes players are making and punish them for it at every turn. And the easiest way to do that is to pay close attention and be ready to adjust. And uh, this is going to be one of the first areas where I think most of our thoughts, most of our, uh, the way we approach is going to be based on how we're reading the play of the other opponents at the table. Now, let's start just in general with our big blind defense range. Again, we're going to start from an under the gun open, see what's important about playing a hand out of position, and then see how we adjust that when we're playing against a more aggressive opponent who's opening in later position, and we can scale accordingly. So first, against a tight opening raise. Now, this is under the gun range. I, I titled this particularly versus a tight open because the villain that plays the same range from seat to seat absolutely exists in Omaha 8 or better. In other words, they think that ace-2 offsuit is always a limp and ace-2 suited is always a raise. So we know that, that was, that's in their preflop raising range. Now, it's not going to be as severe as that. It's not going to be as, you know, over-the-top aggressive. Uh, I'm sorry, over-the-top strong, not aggressive. Uh, but it's still something to keep in mind. Like, players aren't going to suddenly open raise a hand in Omaha eight or better, um, if they truly believe that a hand has a zero or one playability factor, which is pretty common. So we're looking against those types of players. And first off, I mean, we're basically all of our second tier premiums, um, most of our ace wheel hands with any kind of help that are okay to playable are going to be defendable here. You know, it's still a limit Omaha 8 or better game. Um, we are getting a good price to call. Uh, again, a, a big part of the way we're playing pre-flop is dependent on our opponent's post-flop play because that's what we're expecting. That's, 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 that's what formulating a game plan is about. Now, these hands in general are going to be strong enough to defend for pretty much any range, unless it's like the nittiest of nitty. Uh, one nice thing to keep in mind in general is Tight usually correlates to passive uh, when it comes to good games. You know, against good tags, against even like our open raising ranges, I really wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to be defending, I mean, folding any of these hands. So we're fine against good tags, but on the passive side, these hands even increase in value. And that's one of the things I'll be looking at uh, is how passive is my opponent? Because obviously the less they're continuation betting, the more they're going to let us get away with things. Uh, the happier I am to open my range a little bit, but we'll talk about that more. Now, if we don't have those premiums, in other words, we don't really have that ace to go along with our hand, what am I going to be 
deciding whether or not I want to defend. And I think the best way to, to picture it mentally is to, to picture building off a 23 low. Uh, in other words, naked 2-3 isn't quite enough to be defending versus range, but you need a little bit more to go along with it. How many, how much more help can these cards do for you, right? Uh, I'm not too excited about defending 2-3-2-3, uh, but two, three, four, Jack with a Jack high suit. Um, not a bad hand to call, especially against a tight player. Um, tight usually means a little bit more post slop straightforwardness. Uh, we can have a little bit of post slop maneuverability there, and we're getting a good price on our call. We can fluff some good board textures. That's probably one of the worst hands I would consider defending too. So something al along there. Um, you know, if you put another wheel card in there, even a six is helping out, right? You don't want two, three, seven, queen, rainbow. It just doesn't really do much for you. Like as much as that hand has a 23 going in there, there really are no board textures you can check raise, say for ace four or five. And we need to be winning some pots. We need to be scooping some pots out of position. We can't just be calling and hoping to get half and letting our opponent check down. We want to be able to put those uh, ace XX hands uh, in tough spots that now have to decide whether or not they want to call down on a uh, you know, ace Broadway, Broadway, or I'm sorry, ace low Broadway board, when maybe we pick up a flush star or something like that. We, we want to have some post flop strength to our hand. We want scoopness, right? And that's what I'm saying. You can start with the 23 low, and then the more you add to it, the better. Um, you know, three, four, five, king, uh, with the king high suit. Obviously, you know, there's just, there's more flops that we can hit be uh, better than that. So I've taken away the two. But we got a four and a five, which work well. They're two wheel cards, and now I got a king high suit. So now I've got some boards where I can flop nut flush draw uh, plus good low draw, something like that. And most importantly, it's really important that we avoid worse hands in this situation. Uh, you know, over defending versus a loose aggressive open. I'm sorry, versus a tight open. Just it, you're going to have to make so many thin flop decisions that even, even the more passive players are going to be able to play well against you uh, by accident. So uh, really avoiding those middling cards versus any kind of tight open because they are tr almost completely worthless. Um, and what's even worse is on those board textures against the passive players, um, you, you know, we, we can count on them actually checking back sometimes too when we flop and things like that. So eh, as much as it, it may present enough opportunity that we might want to call a little wider just because, oh, that might be a little more passive. In general, just avoiding worse hands is pretty key, specifically with middling cards. Now, I talked a little bit about why we open up our range a little bit. Um, when can we be calling wider, right? Because right now we're on a pretty short leash here when we're defending hands out of position. We are really only focused on wheel esh cards or hands that do okay on ace high board textures slash can peel some middle ones, make some decent top pairs, right? Like that king, two, four, five. Yeah, we got some pretty good board textures too. We can, you know, we flop some decent flush draws. We can have some top pairs plus low draws, things like that. Um, when do we open up our range? When is it acceptable to actually play hands? Because I, I was kind of prodding at the idea of a, a hand having like a Boolean can play or not play value to it. Uh, first and foremost, the wider the opening range, the wider the calling range. Now, equities run in incredibly close in four-card games in general. So this isn't, um, unfortunately, this isn't like, oh, if someone's opening 100% of hands, and, and just like it is in any other game, uh, you can open 100% of hands, but you certainly can't defend them. But when someone is, and I know for a fact, opening all of their 8x and 7x, uh, you know, type hands, so they're they're, you know, and, and even worse, when they're c betting like, you know, um, 78 naked low on a 23 board, um, just a nut worst low draw possible. In other words, just with no regard for not even looking, just clicking. Those hands are just going to have more value because you can call them more um, because your hand is likely to be best a little bit more often. So against a tight player, think about the types of hands that you're going to be blindly check calling three times because you have a little bit of a piece. And that happens in any game, right? You flop top pair in a limit game or, you know, good sec second pair, good kicker against an aggressive player. You're going to end up calling down at, at the very least, if not check raising. Um, 
And what happens against aggressive players that are opening wider is that range of hands are willing to call threes too, too. It simply widens a little bit more. Um, but also it could be a function of uh, the seat the player is raising in. Um, second, we can call wider when there are more players in the pot. This is true, and this is something I think a lot of players struggle with in 08 is like the raise call call and I'm in the big blind with four complete junk cards. How do I know if I can call here? Well, I mean, the good news is the math says it's probably pretty unlikely you're making that big of a mistake unless you're sitting on the worst possible worst hand. Um, you're just getting such a good price that it's pretty likely that uh, your hand is going to flop well enough, uh, often enough that you can call. Now, I think call, could you call, should you call, uh, would you call are all very different questions. Um, but what you should be thinking about in this situation is not so much should I be calling, but you should only be thinking what flops can I lead multiway here? What flops can I call multiway here? What boards can I scoop on? What, what, what board textures is this hand going to do well on, right? Let's say we have nine, nine, six, seven rainbow, and we're trying to see if we want to defend in a multi-way pot. Well, I know a couple of things about nine, nine, six, seven off the top of my head. Number one, um, whenever we flop top set, there is, I mean, we, we could, we could flop a full house. Obviously we can make quads, all those hands. That's fine with any two, with any four cards, you can be able to talk about those combos, right? But when we hit the flop when we really hammer the flop, we make a straight, we flop a wrap. It's never a board texture we can lead. It's never a board texture we can check, raise, or jam multi-way. It's never a board texture that we're happy to have a ton of players in the pot with. Um, we have no protection on suitedness. Uh, it just does not play well multi-way because, yes, we could technically win a hand, but with all the, especially in a multi-way game when you're making these decisions with like a raise and four calls, with all of that just strangeness out there, with all the possibility that, that the players post flop are just going to be jamming the naked low because they know it's a good hand and now you don't know what to do with your second nut straight. There's really not much incentive for us to call there because it's going to be so easy for that to be relatively close to reverse implied odds. We can make a lot of post flop mistakes there and calling as is is barely a function of the price we're getting. And if you really want to break it down, rake is another consideration. So we can we can go even that far. Uh, but that's something that, uh, makes this, a, a, a new game, right? Uh, an unevolved game, as I like to say, um, people haven't gone that far to the point where they know it's even close to, to 110% correct calling. And it's not in PLO either raise and four calls. What's the best possible range. Um, and that's exciting. And that's why we're covering more how to think in the situation as opposed to just basic guidelines. And when you get better at that process, because really what we're doing is we are forming a better post flop plan. We're having a better idea for the way our opponents are going to play, what kind of board textures we can jam and win a big pot with. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing I keep notes on. Uh, player likes to jam naked, nut low, even on flush board, which that situation is obviously way worse. You can see, and if you can't, I mean, feel free to comment, but why? Jamming ace of hearts, three of hearts with no spades on a two, five, eight, all spades is really bad. Um, if someone is re-raising you, you block none of the spades and then there you go. Both the cards are there. Um, and one thing to better post flop position, um, that will mainly keep in mind in, in small blind versus big blind. And we'll talk about an aggressive small blind opening range, what we're going to be defending, but also when the small blind calls, what that does for our post flop position, um, we're going to be able to click if the cutoff opens small blind call, calls our relative position post slop is a little bit better because we're going to get to call closing the action with potential over call already the cutoff has a little bit less incentive to continuation bet so we're getting a better price with maybe a better chance of free cards depending on the post slop play so all these things you want to be keeping in mind when you're trying to decide whether you want whether or not you want to play a hand now we talked about the tight range opening what about versus a more aggressive uh, button opener, the type of player that maybe I think is raising a little bit too much from the button? Um, so obviously, you know, we have our whole 
super tight range thing. We can we don't have to re you know no one's folding ace two <laughs> against this guy, right? We all agree. Um, but wheel cards are very important here. I was happy to have my calling all wheels uh, line here, but the important thing to remember is wheel cards can lead to post flop strength. Um, wheel cards lead to gut shots. Wheel cards lead to scoop hands, um, and wheel cards more importantly dominate the bad junky 47 48 uh, 75 type openings on the low end that i expect a lot of these players to have so we're playing a little bit tighter than our opening and we're profiting because i think these players in general play these hands way too wide and i understand that they have position but not playing them well in position is also a problem um, not saying there can't be situations where you want to be opening some 75s from the button 84 is almost always well and again, when I say the, that, I'm, I don't mean ace-eight four. I mean the bottom two cards. Uh, there may be a few combos and some suitedness to them that I want to play, but these players, you know, with almost no concern, just raising a bunch of junk. So having wheel cards, having hands that... Um, what's nice about wheel cards is when you pick up some lows, you often can pick up a gut shot or something with it, some connectedness to it. It's, it's just much better than bothering with like a 2-7 or something like that. Those hands are just garbage. I'd always, you know... We want to avoid those sevens and eights and nines and sixes. Um, those would be, I would put in the less, uh, less than wheel wheel in category. I need some help. I'm not folding all of my six X and I'm not folding all of my, uh, you know, I guess some of my pr ultimate premium uh, 75s. Like I'm not just going to automatically fold King King seven, five double suited. I'm not going to automatically fold um, yeah, maybe, maybe even like King Queen five, seven double suited. I probably wouldn't automatically fold things like that. Um, but you see it, that, that it's gotta be double suited. Now King Queen six, two single suited, I think is probably worth a defend. Like some of the six X's, if they're pretty good or worth defending a Jack nine, six, two rainbow, uh, is just not going to cut it. Um, the top two cards really do matter quite a bit because we want to have some strong top pair potential. Against aggressive opponents, when we're talking about post-flop game plan, we're looking for hands that can take some take a beating. You know, I'm looking for a hand that my opponent's going to bet two, three times, and I'm pretty comfortable calling. And I also know there's going to be some board textures I can check raise, and I'm going to be check raising wider, of course. You know, maybe instead of check raising my second nut low and, and second nut flush draw, I just need a low and a flush draw. But the villain has a wide range, and you have two choices: open up your range and fight back which is the right choice or the wrong choice, which is tighten up and let them run us over, which is what I love when players do. So um, in general, we're just trying to think about hands that can play post-flop in that way, if that makes sense. And finally, uh, so against tight openers from late position, uh, and more importantly, against really passive players, I get a little speculative post-flop. Because you're getting three and a half to one. I'm mean, sorry, pre-flop. You're getting three and a half to one. If you have hands that can flop nuts, like king, queen, 10, X, hands like that, and players that are going to check back when they pair their bottom card or, um, you know, simply just not continuation bet too much. I like those hands. Um, also against players that don't fire the second barrel because I can flop top pair and check call once and know where I stand immediately and make a 100% make correct fold on the turn. Um, pretty often. And against those players, I don't think it's that bad to be defending pretty wide. Now, when you know a player is going to be betting the turn incredibly wide and just bombing away, uh, the type of player that flops bottom pair plus one live low card and then turns bottom two and bets again anyway, check calling that player twice with naked top pair is just a huge, huge mistake. I, I have seen so much more... Uh, I mean, just winning more since I've started punishing that type of behavior, like just pouncing on it and betting the turn aggressively wide against players that really turn their hand face up as like naked one pair. You can, especially if you have like pair plus low, worst pair plus low uncounterfeitable, like suddenly, even even un, even not uncounterfeitable, suddenly my worst river card, which is me making bad two pair, lets me scoop pretty often. Um, so against aggressive players, it's really important you don't even bother with these hands. Because you, 
are just going to be ending up playing a guessing game out of position very often, unless you kind of hammer the flop, which is a lot harder to do with only a three card hand. Okay, so now we've kind of moved on to the widest of wide ranges that I'm willing to defend. And um, I want to talk a little bit about blind versus blind play um, here and kind of how I'm planning on playing post flop in that situation. Because the games are always so limp, happy, and passive, it's pretty often where you'd find uh, players uncomfortable in the situation. So it's important we have a pretty good feel for the type of stuff that I would expect uh, a small, aggressive small blind to be opening and then how we're going to be defending against it. So the, the first thing I want to just talk about is strategy-wise, blind versus blind, how are you playing? Um, you want to, when I say keep your range in mind, it's important that you don't just three bet your very, very best hands here and let your opponent call and then check fold. Um, and it's important that if the player is raising very, very wide and you want to be, and, and you're not wanting to three bet wide uh, in response, that you want to be calling a ton of your strong hands. In other words, I have no problem with like a pretty aggressive three betting range here against aggressive players. And in the end, against this, the laggiest ones, it's, I think it's the most profitable simply because we can build pots in position. But if you're new to the game or you're just adjusting to these shorthanded situations, I would just suggest calling a lot and even calling some hands you plan on three betting. You want some protection in your range. You want some hands you can call two or three times with. And post flop, what we're going to end up doing is taking our good ace twos there that we don't three bet and turning them into semi bluff races on the turn. Um, or, you know, basically free roll raise on the turn with our good ace two, simply because combinatorically we should be way ahead. But we'll look more into that. But the important thing is you're always keeping your range in mind here. Um, and this is one of those situations, too, where that whole idea of should I raise a hand preflop or not, should I not raise anything, really comes kind of uh, into full circle very quickly. Uh, you get a feel for the way players think they're supposed to be playing. So in general, this is still a situation where wheel cards are going to be very, very good. Now, I'm much more willing to call wide, which would go into our wheel, wheel, uh, worse than wheel, wheel for low needs help. Um, I'm still avoiding naked 78 bad unpaired hands like the plague. Like there's just no need to even bother with hands like that. Now, being out of position as a preflop raiser from the small blind is a pretty big disadvantage post flop. So we're pretty happy to call with almost all the wheel wheel, no help hands at all, because we can play our low draws aggressively. Uh, post flop, punish our opponent with their small weak pairs um, and put them in a lot of tough uh, spots. In terms of the amount of help I'd need now, because I'm going to be in position for my non wheel lows, it is dramatically lower. But I really want to avoid that 86, 87 part of it as much as possible, unless I'm, unless the other two cards are really helping out. Even like a Jack 10, 7, 8. You're in position. It's going to be a lot easier for you to play that hand. You don't have to be worrying about check calling. And you're getting three to one with the button in that spot. So I'm calling almost all of my hands against an aggressive small blind. Uh, it's just such a more profitable situation. It is a four card game. Um, and our opponent has to react to his post flop. Now, a big reason why that's okay, and a big reason why I would just avoid most of those hands for right now, if you're not from, from a comfortable post op play, is because we're going to play our whole range of hands pretty much closer to the same way. Like we're either going to be very aggressive on the flop and things like that against certain opponent types, um, or we're going to be tightening up our preflop range and kind of waiting and raising more later streets and punishing our opponent for bluffing and barreling too much. Um, but for now, I think still needing that help for your extra wheels. Um, and just opening up a little bit to maybe those double suited hands only need a single suit and spots where we needed a five, we only need a six. It's going to be enough for us to call in position. It's just going to be so much tougher for the villain out of position to be playing a guessing game. And on that note, danglers and those hands I talked about before are just not as bad. Like I'm never folding those three card broadways versus any open because we have the button now. So uh, we can raise good turn cards 
uh, against this villain. The villain would have to barrel us out of position with those weak two pairs, which is a must worse spot. And what's nice too is the last word on the big street lets us decide whether or not we want to get that value bet in. So those weak two pairs that maybe we're calling sometimes and losing against, well, now they're going to check call for a bet on the river as a loss, as opposed to the villain just letting them, like the villain basically being able to play perfect poker in position against us. And we just really playing a guessing game because again, this whole time we're trying to put together how these people think they're supposed to be playing Omaha 8 or better. So when we have position and the ability to value bet more, it's okay for us to be calling a little bit wider. So let's kind of wrap up the big blind here with our just blind defense guidelines. How are we approaching this as a function of our other ranges and other seats? In general, we're just looking to avoid non-wheel lows out of position. Um, there are a lot of reasons I've kind of beat that to death this episode, uh, but it's really important. Uh, those middling cards do you little to no good. And one of my happier moments is seeing a player defend, you know, like I said, the eight, seven, seven, four, just the stone unplayable out of position. Um, you can't look at four cards the same way in 08 as you do in Omaha high. It just, that makes literal, the literal of no sense. It's a, it's a completely different game. Half the money goes in a different direction. Um, and that's not even that good of a PLO hand anyway. Now, another thing to keep in mind, I didn't really talk about four card high hands. I'm never really three betting those out of the blinds. I don't think it makes much sense, uh, especially when we talk about post flop. Uh, we expect those board textures to have good fold equity. Um, I'm sorry, if we expect us to have good fold equity on those board textures. Um, now, when it comes to what is your high hand doing, what do I mean by that? It's that really it's important to have a post flop game plan with your high hand before you even decide whether or not to take a flop with it. Is your high hand hoping to flop top pair and then maybe get checked down? Uh, is your high hand going to be able to make some nuts straights? Is your high hand going to make top set? What is the part of your high hand that this does here? Um, how likely is it that if we do make top pair, not now we don't need to know the math on, behind this, uh, but you do need to know if I do make like, how likely is this hand to have top pair? And then what kind of lows can I have with it then? Um, you know, like a hand like King, Queen, two, three, yes, we can have top pair, but we can never have top pair plus the nut low. It's just not possible with that hand. Um, and really like the question you need to be asking is, am I hoping to flop two pair or better here? And if that's what you need to do, you need to be getting a pretty good price before you want to be considering calling. So just something to keep in mind. Now, a, a good way to kind of gauge your self um, and see, kind of judge your own progress, because win rate is one thing, but I mean, I know it's a more loose and passive game, but it's very easy to run very bad uh, for a long time in Omaha 8 or better. And when we're trying to play kind of to the pulse of the game here and kind of creating this dynamic game plan, it's important that we keep an eye on what we expect to be happening post-flop. What do we really think these other players are going to be doing? Um, am I defending my king, queen, 10, six with the queen, six of spades against the player that I think is going to check back the turn 80%. And the last three times they bet the turn and the last three times that players bet, uh, I mean, the last three times or four other times they've been in a hand, they've bet the turn as well. Like am I, am I deluding myself here? Does it make no sense? And it's important to match up with that all and say, is that all happening? Is the way I am seeing these hands to play post flop out actually happening. Now we're going to talk obviously next week on flop play approach from in position and out of position. Um, but in general, if you think about it from, from the perspective of the player in position, you're forced to react to my actions. Yes. Players can donk bet, et cetera, et cetera, but that's fine. You're still out of position. It's, it's a pretty big disadvantage. And when we're out of position, we are the one reacting to that action. So we need to be keeping an eye on whether or not a, what we think is happening is actually happening and B are our reactions to that. And is the way we're formulating this game plan out of position, is that the right approach? Do we think it's the right approach? Okay. So we've basically discussed what we're opening from all the seats. Um, what are we defending from out of position here? What kind of stuff are we defending from the blinds versus tight opens, loose opens, and what does a blind battle kind of look like in, in an 08 game? Preflop three betting in four card games in general is very unique and even more so when it comes to Omaha eight or better. 
If you compare No Limit Hold'em to PLO, uh, one thing that happens a lot more in PLO is there's a three bet and then a cold call. All right, there's no all in necessary. You have four cards, so you can hit a lot more board textures. Um, there's also just a lot more hands that are very good that kind of don't want to re-raise. That's something that can happen. In other words, um, you know, you have ace king versus queens in uh, a, a no limit hold'em game, but in a, in a four card game, you can have aces versus you know, you know queen jack ten nine versus five six seven eight. Uh, versus, you know, queen, queen, three, three, or something like that. There's a lot of hands that maybe want to hit a bunch of flops. So when we're three betting pre-flop um, in a four card game, we're kind of playing with a little bit more respect for the other players around the table. Um, now, I, I, you can also draw that same parallel there. If we go uh, now, by the way, from no limit hold'em and PLO to limit hold'em and Omaha eight or better, it's kind of the same thing where in a limit hold'em game, we're not expecting anyone to fold to our three bets. And the same is true in a limit Omaha eight or better game. And there's even more of the raising our three bets are now cold called. So as I was saying though, three betting preflop in Omaha eight or better isn't just about uh, our hands. It's about kind of the way we uh, see our hand interacting with the other players at the table and setting ourselves up for good post-flop situations because we have no fold equity I mean, the literal none um, maybe once or twice if someone has raised and fold to my three bet, but it's always online. So I just chalk it up to a misclick. Um, and players, again, we talked about that Boolean approach to is a hand playable. Well, that's just really elasticity, right? Um, is there any elasticity for their calling range here preflop? In other words, um, are they sensitive at all to the price of the call? So if it's four bets cold to them and they have ace two, are they still going to call? Well, it's a playable hand, so you better believe I'm going to call. Now, we've got up here two super premium hands on the board. I've got ace two, three, four, double suited and ace king, queen two, double suited. I didn't want to just say like preflop three betting, oh, your premiums are pretty good because in general, uh, when we're playing against super duper tight players, we're always not happy about three betting anyway. So we're probably going to be calling and against the more loose, aggressive players. Uh, it's not that big of a mistake to be three betting them uh, pretty aggressively, but it's more about what the hands do when they three bet and why we might want to cold call versus three bet and uh, how that's going to affect post slot play. And, you know, it's kind of a tell that I have it listed up here. Ace two, three, four and ace king, queen two. Because you see that the, the I want to focus on the difference between the high and the low aspect. In general, uh, the high cards that go along with your low uh, help play better heads up. The ace, king, queen, two is so good. I'm going to probably be three betting it almost always anyway, because it's just such a good hand. But uh, in general, something like ace, Broadway, Broadway, wheel, premium, those hands that we might be opening from under the gun that we discussed in the six max range, those hands play much better for a three bet to the point where you're better off trying to push out the action behind you to try to play a pot heads up. Now, what's nice about these hands is they're so good that if we do get called, they still play. And this is why they're double suited, right? Because I mean, how often do we need a flush heads up? But the fact that these hands are double suited allows us to play well multiway. Now, Ace two, three, four double suited. If we three bet that, there's a lot of board textures that we continuation bet on that are just actually pure bluffs, right? Um, on an ace two, of course we could flop, you know, ace two X, but that's something. Uh, we could flop two, seven, eight, but again, that's the two pair draw. But ace two, three, four on king, queen, jack, all diamonds is just a stone cold bluff. And we really only can put one bet in. So there's a little bit of downside there playing against loose, aggressive players. Also, it just plays so well multi-way and we could jam it so often uh, that it, it may be worth considering cold calling a hand like that versus a loose open to try to welcome more players into the hand. Uh, that being said, any situation with multiple players in the pot already we really just want to make the pot as big as possible. So if it goes raise and cold call, I'm not hoping to invite more players because everyone's already been invited. They've already taken off their coats and had their first drink at that point when there's multiple players in the pot. More importantly, even so in the small blind and in the big blind. 
when there's a raise and a bunch of calls and you have something as good as these hands, it's important to be jamming. We'll talk a little bit about those spots uh, as we go forward through some more uh, three betting topics. Now, I just talked a little bit about this all, so I won't reiterate everything, but three betting keys, again, number one, our three bets are, are for value. We don't have any fold equity here when we three bet. Uh, we have fold equity to our left, so there is value in isolation, but I would put that under the value umbrella. In other words, this hand is better to three bet because this player's range is wide and I could potentially get them heads up. The funny thing is when their range is that wide, it's probably okay enough for us to call there. So we are now three betting for the extra value there. The question you wanna be asking yourself at all points in times though, is what does a three bet accomplish? You know, I was hinting at it with the ace two, three, four hand there, but uh, what are we trying to accomplish when we three bet a hand like ace two, three, four double suited out of the small blind? We're trying to get everyone to put some more money in because we think in general, we're gonna get about half those chips back <laughs> at least and sometimes just even more. And, you know, one thing you can't really count on is people's post-flop play. Uh, it's sporadic, which is why we're formulating this game plan and which is why we're paying attention to frequencies and constantly keeping ourselves in check and all these things. But we can't really bank on a continuation bet and getting to check raise the field. And plus, what if it's a player in late position that raise? So it's just a good spot to be, uh, that's a good spot to be building a pot. Uh, are we three betting to isolate? Uh, the thing you want to avoid, the big mistake, is three betting because you think you have to, i.e. because you have pocket aces. So therefore, you think you have to raise. I mean, there could be some very real situations where folding pocket aces is correct. Uh, I mean, if the hand doesn't play multi-way and you have to call a raise in a three bet or something like that, uh, I mean, hey, two of the aces are dead. So that means there's no more to come on the flop. So the other two cards don't really matter much. I mean, and you're really gonna just play a hand with a naked pair of aces, like, you know, ace, ace, seven, jack, rainbow or something, uh, when you know you can never flop top set of aces. But it's important to know what your three bet is trying to accomplish. And the only way you can do that is with the awareness of the people to your left at all points in times, right? I'm trying to push those people out or I'm trying to keep those people in. Uh, the person to your right that you're three betting, I'm trying to isolate that person. I am just raising for value because my hand is good and I know the people to my left don't care. Um, yeah. And most importantly, and kind of the reason why I wanted to, to hammer this home the most is three betting does not equal initiative. When we're isolating wide, you notice we have the two high card hands, the you know the premium big cards to go with some low help. And again, like as I mentioned, those are hands we can continuation bet pretty much 100%. Uh, and that's a big reason why I like three betting those hands in that spot. Now, if I was to three bet ace two, three, four double suited out of the small blind and get called seven ways and the flop was king, queen, jack, all diamonds, I would just check and fold. The reason why we can be three betting these hands out of position so like honestly almost like obnoxiously just like turning our hand face up is because it, people don't affect their post flop play. If there's lack of elasticity pre flop for calling, um, street to street logic isn't something you find in your average poker player, right? Someone paying attention to what happens from street A to street B, and uh, you know sometimes people just ignore it. Uh, so we're raising in this spot, we're three betting in this spot. What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to build a pot. And that is people we're assuming are just going to read us for always C betting. And when we check, it's not like, oh, he checks and gives up a, a, a good amount and only bets with the goods, but that's the way we can play. And that's what you can get away with. Um, but it's important to remember that three betting does not equal initiative. Uh, if I did three bet light and got cold call behind, I'm not gonna light a bet on fire. If my fold equity is that low and my equity is that low, I have absolute nothing, uh, then I have no incentive to bet. And it's something that can happen in Limit Omaha 8 or better. It really can't happen in many other games, right? Um, in non-limit formats, uh, you can give people worse prices. And you know, here, people are getting the best price they can get because it's a limit game. And also equities run super close and players like to call down. So it's just something to keep in mind. Don't burn that extra bet, right? Three bets have value because our hands have strength. But the only reason why that happens, like hands, you don't just get dealt a hand and then it you, you magically get chips. You have to play it well post-flop. 
So something to keep in mind. So finally, just to kind of wrap up here, we're going to cover uh, just three bet ranges uh, in general. This has really been alluded to uh, through most of this. I just wanted to cover kind of the logic behind three betting, but we're pretty much always three betting our ultra premium hands. What do I mean by ultra premiums? Uh, your suited ace twos that are very good with good help going for them. Um, your ace Broadway wheel wheel double suited type hands, the very, very best. Uh, I know I probably come up with a better phrase than ultra premium, but the cream of the crop, you cannot be making that big of a mistake three betting. And a big reason why I am a fan of that too is a lot of that people not respecting my small blind three bet, even though it's only the nuts, uh, comes from having a good aggressive image in late position. And again, uh, players playing out of position is not very good. Making big pots, very profitable. We talked about it before as well. High plus wheel for isolation is uh, in terms of high only, I'm not, not high only, uh, in terms of uh, three betting hands for, this is the type of hand that I, I'm much more excited to be three betting a loose aggressive player with. I think, um, for example, uh, ace three, seven, nine rainbow versus ace jack 10, five with a suit. Um, some players may say, well, the three is better than the five. I'd rather have that. But if I'm three betting an aggressive player, I kind of want uh, the suit. I want to have uh, just a, a stronger high hand in general um, because the low is not nearly as important if this if this player is going to be bombing it away with, you know, five, six, queen, nine there or something like that from the cutoff. Like if they're that wide, I'd rather just have something that can make some top pairs that can take some heat on a lot of board textures where in a hand like a739 rainbow, I mean, you've got to flop a low draw because uh, otherwise you really can't get, you know, if you get check raised, you're kind of in trouble. So a big reason why we're picking our hands is the post slot playability, which in essence is equity. So uh, I think the logic is the same in Hold'em, but it, it doesn't translate as quickly. And we talked about it before, the lovely advantage of our multi-way pump hands, hands that we want to pump the size of the pot uh, multi-way, just our super premium, low only. We're looking for suits, ace, and multiple wheel cards. Um, yeah, they, 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 these really just kind of overlap with the ultra premium, but it's just important that we are three betting those uh, in multi-way pots to juice it. Uh, I think adding more players to the pot, a lot of people may take their foot off the gas and think like, well, maybe my hand's not nearly as good, but you should look at it more as getting players to put in extra bets. Um, and then you get to dictate some post flop action. And I, I talked about it before the Jack, Jack seven, five hand, just uh, avoiding these bad pocket pairs. There's no, I know people feel gross, like folding pocket Queens when there's an under the gun open. But uh, again, if as much as your Queens, maybe that maybe top pair at some point, You've now got to get five cards that are all below a queen on the board. Let's even put a queen in there. So there's no aces and kings. I mean, something's paired or there's a straight. Uh, we are going to be, I mean, if even if we're in position, it's still kind of a guessing game. And what I love about players playing hands like this is they always have showdown value. So they automatically, you know, they're going to pay you off once on the river. Um, that about does it for this installment of Beginning Omaha 8. Um, blind play and well, three betting in general, I think is pretty straightforward. We're just looking for good cards to pump the size of the pot and uh, occasionally to isolate a player. Um, I think blind defense is something you will certainly get better at with experience. Any questions or hands you've played out of position, please feel free to post them here in a thread or anywhere on the forums and I'll keep my eyes peeled until next time. This is Chuck for juicescrack.com. I'll see you on the forum.